A, a very good a very good evening to everyone and thank you for joining in such large numbers um it's the uh, first a bit of uh, uh, of the celebrations that we kick in today for the society of fetal medicine we are 10 years old now and um, what should i say 10 years uh, young and i'm truly looking uh, forward to an exciting program with ravi chawi you know he was voted our most favorite speaker in india consecutively for the last 9 years and i'm really looking forward to his talk today but before that let me take this uh, take this chance to thank uh, viewers we have today not only from all over india but a large number from uh, the russian federation we have uh, invitees from israel who are here we have a lot of people who've come in from turkey we also have afghanistan surprisingly which i hope is a good sign we have uh, pakistan and bangladesh we have uh, sri lanka the maldives and when i'm looking down the list it's really marvelous it's all the way up to korea and all the way down uh, to uh, bali indonesia and it's a real pleasure to be here for this uh, should i call it an anniversary celebration should i call it um, a foundation day celebration of the society of fetal medicine um or should i just call it a birthday party because i think it's the most fantastic um i will uh, share with you a bit which will take you very briefly through i promise i won't make it very long because i know everybody is just wanting to listen to uh, to ravi right away but i really wanted to bring uh, to you um this photograph from 2011 we had our first international congress uh, on october 1st and 2nd 2011 in new delhi and we were extremely impressed with ourselves because we had ravi chawi who specially came in uh, he'd been encouraging me for several years uh, to do this and uh, this is a photograph from 2011 and i found it on facebook a few days ago and i said wow it's so nice to see that when you're in association with a society of field medicine you start looking younger with every passing year <laughs> um, we uh, had an excellent meeting we as uh, spoke uh, that day on uh, uh, the intracranial translucency and we already realized that it's a 6 year old description he had first described it in 2005 uh, we had dr ic uh, varma as our founder president uh, you know how uh, the society of fetal medicine started and for those of you who do not uh, we were actually a part of uh, another society which was a society for prenatal diagnosis and therapy and then the delhi unit of that society was six times the size of the all india unit and we said now what do we do so we said okay um, make us big because we are the biggest and everybody ignored us and we said now what do we do so professor i see where i said it's time to grow up let's have our own uh, meeting let's have our own society because we seem to be bigger than all the parent societies and that's how the society of fetal medicine began to give each one of us an opportunity of not being sidelined to give each one of us an opportunity opportunity to rise to interact with with marvelous names like ravi chawi who have supported us throughout over these last 10 years and of course get the guidance of stalwarts like professor ic varma who continues to be the founding editor of our journal of fetal medicine as well as the founding president of the society of fetal medicine <coughs> that meeting was a big meeting and um, we had over 600 attendees and in this photograph see professor snee bhargav who was the first to say that ultrasound belongs to everybody she firmly believed that for ultrasound to survive uh, we had to make sure that everybody should be able to do good ultrasound scan and not let the technique get a bad name and i said well excellent and that's where we started off she was waiting uh, for us to bring in a little footstool so that she could stand on it we couldn't find one in the hotel so we let her stand behind the podium where we couldn't see her and we learned over the years that yes some of our attendees and some of our friends will require that we also had that day with us um, uh, dr kamal bakshi who was the um, founder of many techniques of fetal medicine in india and is an active member with us today and has some excellent scholarships and orations to her name uh, today we went on uh, the inspiration actually came from this this was a course we did in 2015 and it was the first um, uh, meeting that i had with with ravi chawi and he said of course you can learn this is not difficult you can do it and i said no nah, i can't do this then i said the machine is too expensive he says no get going and that's where the whole story started and he says no you come and we will we'll, we will do this and i said well i'm not sure i can come he says then i will come 
this was two weeks after we'd had the massive floods in uh, in uh, Mumbai in 2005. And yeah. we had to change the, the date of the meeting because there was ongoing floods in Mumbai. He says, okay, what do we do? I said, well, come to Bangalore if you can. And he came to Bangalore and he canceled the other weekend that he had somewhere else in Europe. And he says, okay, instead of Mumbai, I'll come to Bangalore. And this is a picture there from that meeting. I got certified as someone who can do ultrasound. And I was just so pleased. This is the only photograph I have of anybody in my clinic. And everyone says, who is this man? I said, you know, he's the one who's written those wonderful books. And then I tell them the name. They said, oh, he looks much older then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for getting things going then Ravi it was really really absolutely charming I relish this photograph it's the basis of my existence today and then of course you agreed to even give us a live demonstration and you can see there's Bernard Benoit in the background in that same meeting in 2011 it was a very well received meeting it was uh, on the day of the workshop we actually had 900 participants we were able to divide the costs that way and Bernard Benoit gave us some excellent insights. Ravi was there giving us four hours of live demonstration. The crowd didn't want to go away. We got thrown out of the hotel room at 8 p.m. They said, look, we need this room for another meeting. And I said, okay, then we we'll give up. And um, that's how we had our very first successful meeting. We've never, ever looked back. And it was so wonderful because Ravi is so good at giving to everyone. Here he is with, with all the delegates just, uh, getting uh, their, their their copy of the second edition of his book signed and it was absolutely fantastic i think that's the third edition yes that's the third edition and willing to pose for photographs with everybody and you can see there is people here who've grown up ever since then and we have uh, bimala uh, our president from next year onwards for two years standing right there next to ravi and it's so nice to be able to pass on the baton to him to handle the society field medicine uh, from next year onwards. As you can see, Bernard Benoit has been a great friend and supporter. And he's promised to actually do programs for us in the coming year as well. He's now um, re-established um, uh, in terms of what he's going to be practicing and how much relaxation he's going to give himself. But it's really going to be very nice that we're going to be able to achieve um, uh, so much more together in the coming year in terms of our training. And uh, COVID has had this one advantage that it's opened up the virtual world. We've also understood that we can run workshops and have a much better communication when we're all together and, it's, uh, and we can have smaller and more frequent workshops. And uh, now that we're all in a better financial position, we can actually afford some of this activity. And then again, to show how wonderful it is to be able to share, and that was our registration desk at that time and everybody waiting patiently for their certification. And you can see someone was trying to find the receipt on whether Ravi Chawi had paid his money or not. <laughs> it was the joke then. And this was um, a few years later, we'd started with the tradition of CardioCon and this was our CardioCon we had in 2017 and um, absolutely fantastic guidance on how to do a scan, how to look for abnormalities. Everybody said, He's going to speak for 17 hours in two days. I said, yes, it's actually 19 hours in two days. Um, it was uh, at that time also an ISWAC recognized program. So we had a huge international presence. And as usual, we ran out of space. And we had 600 registrations come in in the last one week and we didn't know what to do. So we just picked up another hall behind it. It was a narrower hall, but we had no choice. And so we did it right there. And, and Ravi was, of course, so obliging. He smiled through it all, smiled through the two days. And we had such a wonderful time uh, learning from him. In that meeting, we also had Fred Ushakov, who had come in to handle uh, some of uh, the, the lectures with Ravi. And this is one of the, uh, the, 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 the product launches we had in that same meeting in 2017. And then uh, there, that's that product launch meeting and more smiles. And so we're very happy to see that mingling with everybody as usual. And you can see that every single chair in that hall used to always be full. And the room was always full of even people who had general practice in obstetrics. And that was the main thing that we'd managed to hit. We were so happy that here we were in a situation where we were reaching out directly to people in general obstetrics and they were able to tell us that, yes, we benefit from this information. We know exactly what to do with this information. And so it truly, truly worked out very well for us. And uh, you can see uh, Dr. Suresh sitting right there, Chandalula there, and a host of other people in the background. And then 
um, this was that famous um, that talk about the intracranial translucency. It was fantastic. And he said, yes, 2009 was the, uh, was the article in the uh, journal, in the White Journal. And then 2011, we were hearing him in person. Uh, fantastic indeed. Always very kind to share everything with us. He even went on to sign all those certificates on behalf of ISWOG and put us in touch with ISWOG right in front. And, you know, we've grown as uh, sister organizations, if I may use the word, over the years. And we work together with ISWOG to bring a lot of uh, our speakers to you. So with that, uh, uh, let me also mention that we've had the privilege of several presidents after that. After Professor I.C. Varma, we had uh, Dr. Deepika Dekka, who came in as president, and then we had uh, Dr. Ratnapuri, and I took over after that. And then, of course, very wisely, Dr. T.L. and Praveen has come in and uh, put all our systems into place with him and Dr. Sunil Mehta. We've had a lot of our legal work sorted out. We've had our finances sorted out. Everything is right there. I won't bore you with more of this. I think we've all managed to find our little places. We have uh, been able to divide you on uh, Facebook as well as YouTube because we knew that there would be an overload here. But uh, uh, this is uh, really nice that so many of you have come together. And uh, thank you, Rabbi, for making this the first of our major events in our birthday celebrations. And uh, thanks so much for being with us for the last so many years and for inspiring so, so, so uh, very well. Um, I now hand over the floor to Dr. Thiel and Praveen to give a formal introduction and then we're all waiting for your absolutely marvelous talk. Yeah. Praveen, over uh, to you. And good evening, Ashok, and good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome, uh, Ravi, for uh, this uh, birthday celebration. Hi, Praveen. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. And uh, it's, uh, we are 10 years old and we don't, we are still young. And you, we, with yeah. you around, we feel much younger. And uh, you are, you are, man, uh, th there is no need to introduce you because uh, SFM is uh, part and parcel of, uh, Ravi is part and parcel of SFM. And as you are our honorary uh, member, I think it's a great privilege to invite you. And uh, I mean, it's an auspicious time that you are going to start this birthday celebrations. And the first event is going to be headed by you. And uh, thank you, please take over. And then uh, I, I know you, you believe in simple things. And uh, that's the reason why we choose this topic of simple science uh, for uh, complex uh, syndromes. I think you'll make it much more simpler so that uh, we simple people I hope so. understand, understand that. Thank you, Rathi. Thanks, thank you. Uh, thanks, Praveen, and thanks, Ashok, for the nice introduction. And I'm really uh, honored and now really uh, embarrassed by these nice words at the beginning. And uh, do you hear me well? Yes. You hear me well? Yes, we hear you the slides okay, great. yes. So, uh, yeah, and it was a long time ago, so I remember, and I remember when uh, we, you, uh, after this meeting, you went in the basement, you were sitting in a dark room uh, together on a table, and then you discussed, and the evening you, said, you told me, now we founded this uh, society, and I will give you the dates until 2022, you have to come every year. And was coming almost, I think, in the beginning of May was the date. So I said, okay, and tried to one 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 year to be off. I said, yeah, please let me one year not come. And then anyway, it was really nice, nice time. And I enjoyed all the years being there with you, as you have noticed from the photos. It's not, let's say, not selected. These are this is a reality. And uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate people who want to learn because this is the way I uh, approach ultrasound. And uh, I, I, let's say, I had several teachers in my career, not let's say the one who uh, taught me, but the one who inspired me. There were one group uh, showing how good they are, like, I don't know, not sit name, sad names, but then there are a second group who tries to show you simple things to say, Make it simple and people will adapt uh, this approach, like Kipros, for example. You know, the Nucle, Nucle is by far the simplest um, screening tool in comparison to the difficult uh, scores and so on. So, uh, again, thank you very much. But I don't know, Ashok, when you offered me your, you wrote a book on 3D gynecology, but I don't remember. Is it, was it in, in um, 2002? Where were we there? It was in 2002. 
yeah, but I don't know where you gave me this book. I said, I have the book of Qur'ana, but I remember you. This is why I rem- when, yeah. when we went to uh, I, I the, gave the floods, in- went to Bangalore. I said, I yeah. know this guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so thank you very much. And um, so also for Praveen and for Ashok for the nice words. And ladies and gentlemen, so I was asked to speak on simple sense for complex uh, conditions. And this is what I will we'll start with you now. So um, in the next 45 minutes, uh, you know, this is quite simple, fetus with Down syndrome. And what you should keep in mind is how are we approaching syndromes? In general, we take books of uh, genetics. And honestly, if you take a book of genetic and seek for Down syndrome, they will write for you uh, the, un- the mongoloid uh, uh, eye and uh, the typical features and uh, but let's say signs like the absent nasal bone, which is very powerful, is not present there. So this is why we need, for example, or the Arza was not existing for years. So this is why we need some uh, signs, let's say, even from postnatal, uh, from postnatal genetics, but many other adapted to fetal life. This is why any new syndromes uh, or syndrome where the signs are published in utero can be helpful for many of us. This is why what I try to do is to, to uh, when I read literature or I see talks by, done by friends at meeting, I would like to adapt what I'm seeing there. And uh, this is why uh, you should keep in your head a lot of uh, syndromes. There are books you can look for, but you can also go and ask Google or PubMed or in future it will be only all stored in, in uh, artificial intelligence. I will speak one word at the end on this. So uh, in comparison to 2021, if you see an Asian corpus callosum with the plexus cyst, is it automatically uh, transmit 18? No, because you have other signs of 18. Do you know what is the underlying cause? Or if you have cardiomyopathy here, what are you going to do with this fetus? This is why what I want you to uh, learn today, some uh, known signs, classical signs I will repeat, but some uh, not so really unknown signs. And uh, let's say I will, of course, show you only cases uh, I could solve because the cases I cannot solve are uh, not so nice. Now, I want at the beginning to share with you uh, some concern. Uh, f- some people now nowadays think that ultrasound and uh, fetal medicine works this way. Uh, you identify an anomaly, you take an, a sample of amniotic fluid, you give it to the genetics and you say, please do carotid RNA exam. And then you can rely and say, please give me one espresso and you have no headache. But what I want you is to challenge. This is not the way I like. The want to challenge as a specialist, and we'll show, uh, I want you at the end to be excellent fit medicine. So in a way that you go to the geneticist, you tell him, please seek for this anomaly because there are many signs. I think this is syndrome A. And they say, no, no way, because blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, you are right. But sometimes, of course, you are not. So uh, this is why, as an inspiration, you don't. Uh, we don't put uh, doctors. I will put these uh, people, Sherlock and uh, House MD and uh, Colombo. Because every one of these has this approach. And at the end of the day, I think our approach in utero when we scan a fetus is always a mixture of, of uh, these. For example, uh, the Dr. House, what you like it in his approach is he has a lot of knowledge. In general, you think, how, how comes that he knows so many, so many things? This is why I would recommend you always to read articles and to, uh, to be always up to date. And personally, I'm a little bit disappointed from the white journal because this used to be a journal where you have a lot of nice images of uh, rare conditions where you can learn from, but because of the impact factors they run now and they publish mainly, uh, let's say, either uh, studies, which is okay, or meta-analysis of uh, thousands of data where you say, okay, but I want to see how ultrasound look like. So this is why, uh, yeah, it's not as, for me, as useful as it used to be in the past, specifically for some rare conditions. I like the approach of Sherlock because uh, w- when you do the scan, you are thinking of one uh, thing, but you have also in mind some details and the details at the end reveals the diagnosis. So this is where you say, oh, he's clever. So this is why you, you should not focus on one aspect, but keep an overview. And as soon as you see something, uh, uh, let's say, uh, coping with another abnormality switch, and make a new combination of your uh, information. And last but not least, I, I love Colombo when I was a child. This is the most uh, 
the, the best episodes I were looking at because I, you know the questions he's asking at the end is always ultimate. So uh, if you have the correct question to yourself or to the patient, you know exactly what's going on. So this is why I hope we will use this and uh, we we have some typical hints for syndrome. They can be simple, like specific. If you see abdomen, you know what you're looking for. There are other syndromic conditions when you see a bone, a shortened bone. So you see, oh, it is skeletal dysplasia. And uh, well, uh, some expect from you to uh, run, uh, let's say in your mind, 350 genes, which is not possible, but uh, the most common can be, can be easily done. And uh, sometimes there are conditions like ventricular megaly where you don't know really what you're looking for at the beginning. And then it is, uh, let's say, uh, tapping in the dark. So this is how I think we work. We have uh, some signs. And once you see, this is a tractography of a corpus callosum. And once you see a sign, you put it to the other side of the brain where you have collected numbers of syndrome. And as you, you see, if you don't have it in mind, there is the OMIM, the, uh, the, the library of, uh, of Congress where you have the uh, online medallion disorders. And this is where you can seek for the combination of findings, but in general, it's your brain. So this is why we combine known syndromes or even syndrome you saw at meetings or syndrome we read about with some signs. And as soon as we see the sign, we see, we try to combine. So let's say now, let's start a few words on hard anomalies. We have the typical karyotype abnormalities, which I 21, 18, 13, which is known. We have the microarray as the George and Williams Boyron syndrome, typically. And we have the parallel exome like uh, TSC charge and Kabuki syndrome. But this is another talk. I will discuss this at another occasion, I hope. But let's say now uh, the tuberous sclerosis, uh, Bourneville. Now, uh, the condition is very common, one out of 6,000 births, which is you can calculate. It's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, could be as common as Rathmi 13. But, you know, it's easy to detect because you see the rhabdomyoma. But you have to keep in mind that 84% of the cases can be solved by molecular genetics and uh, of the TSC1 and TSC2 gene, which are uh, involved in the mTOR uh, path pathways. But keep in mind also that 15 to 20% are inherited by one parent. So in other words, and this is one of my earliest cases here, April 94 on April 96, I wrote at that time multiple abdomyoma and tuberous sclerosis because it was likely since the mother had uh, epilepsy and this was uh, the first time. But at that time, there were two things since we had in the mean, we have in the meantime genetic confirmation, which was started in the late 90s. We had at that time one lab who did it in Germany for four weeks time. And we know also that the brain lesions can be seen in utero. So this is why you see the different shape. You have one small, you have multiple fall, you have one large one. So, uh, and this is why I told you before, if you have the knowledge like uh, the house MD that some are inherited from one parent, what you do when you scan, this is my tip for you, turn on the light, what Sherlock says, and watch the patient carefully and ask them, do you have epilepsy, skin lesions, facial skin uh, anomalies? Or ask, is, do you have a brother or a mother having epilepsy? And they say, how do you know? My mother had epilepsy, but uh, she's okay on the medications. And then you know that they may be affected. So these are three patients uh, where I do this the same. I turn on the light, the light on and I saw this. This is the latest one I had. She came, she's an immigrant from Syria. She had epilepsy and at 22 weeks, well, she came at 12 weeks because of the drug she's, she's taking and assume, well, it looks like medication and the risk of spinal bifida, but was normal. At 20 weeks, I said, oh my God, how did I not notice that it could be uh, tuberous sclerosis? And uh, uh, I asked her to remove the mask and uh, you see here, these are the lesions and the fetus had a, a single uh, uh, rhabdomyoma. And then uh, we knew that she has a mutation and she confirmed and baby is delivered. So you see here, these are three cases. So think when you see up the myoma of looking to the face and to the skin of the patients. Now, what are what do the brain finding look like? It's interesting because you should know not only that there are some findings, but you should know where to seek for. And you see here from one study called Tosca study, the rate of uh, cortical tuber are 80% and uh, the uh, superepidemial uh, uh, nodules are 80%. These are the most common ones. So what, what you should seek is in the peripheral part of the brain, some uh, large echogenic uh, structures, and you should seek in the region of the here, exactly here, where you look at the, in the frontal view, 
uh, on the region of the foramen of Monroe, you have the SEN, uh, which can be found. So this is why it's easy because you can compare left and right. And these are here, these are rare conditions, the, the Sega, which are the giant astrocytoma in utero. So in other words, when you are seeking for the SEN, the heterotopia, you see it in the region of the uh, foramen of Monroe. And when they are large, they can lead to obstruction and to unilateral ventricomegaly. And knowing this, and this is here a, a histology of a case, you can see that is exactly the typical legion, and this is where I seek for them. So knowing where they are, then it's easy to go there and to scan. In the past, I was looking for anything in the brain, but in the meantime, we have enough data from postnatal uh, MR, so, so you can we translate them into. And the other uh, part is that uh, the so-called tubers in the cortex, where uh, when the child dies or used to die in the past, uh, they were like, uh, le le like let's say, uh, hard uh, uh, hard structures, and this is where Bourneville discovered that these are the tubers. And you see in the region where there are these echogenic, there is an abnormal gyration here. So this is only seen by vaginal ultrasound. You rarely see it abdominally. So take your time and see for it. And you see this fetus has has both in the frontal view but in the linear probe. And I'll show you an example now. This is a fetus. I saw a rhabdomyoma. I don't see anything in the brain. Nothing. 23 weeks to chasing gestation. I, said, I told the lady, you know, these things appear a little bit later on. The same brain at 28 week gestation, you see the, the filling of many, many uh, echogenic uh, dots here. These are the whole tuber. And look at from the frontal view, you see in addition to the nodular heterotopia, you see the echogenity. So take your time. 25 weeks, start by scanning the brain abdominally. I will start always at 22 weeks, but uh, almost cases when they appear, they appear after 25, six weeks. And I feel it is better and more comfortable than MR. In MR, you hardly see the, the tuber, but you mainly see the SVNs. You know his guy? This guy is, as you see in his hand, it's written here, number 22. This is Angelo de George. And he described in the 60s a disease where there is a cardiac anomalies and thymus aplasia. In the meantime, it was called in the uh, early 90s, CATCH-22, abbreviation for uh, cardiac anomalies, abnormal facies, thymus hypoplasia, cleft palate, and so on. But it was abandoned since it is now too complicated and it's not only summarizing these. So uh, the typical images here are, you should focus on the kind of anomalies. So the anomalies typically are, are the interruption arc or uh, the conotruncal anomalies like uh, absent polyvalve syndrome or common arterial trunk, but rarely, but also possibly some VST or transposition of great arteries or malposition. So this is why the risk increases if you have an association with an ARSA or right aortic arc. But let's see, what we started working on in the mid 90s was the thymus. And uh, Yaron Zara listening to us here today, and he also published an observation how the thymus looks normally in the year 2000, and this is where we started. I had done a collection of uh, abnormal cases and normal cases because with the high resolution, we were able to see that uh, there's a difference between the lungs and uh, the thymus here in the middle. And uh, you see in these cases, there was they have all small or hypoplastic thymus, and some of these may have had like uh, it's not uh, shown here, they may have also normal heart. So the, uh, the abnormal thymus here is a typical uh, sign, which is typically when it's absent. Sometimes in a small thymus, you may have conditions with the trisomy 21, but let's focus now on uh, the 22.1. And you see here, it's a, a video where seeking for an abnormality of the great vessels, you are obliged anyway to look at the three vessel track of you. Don't focus only on the great vessels, but only go and uh, seek and check for the region between the, uh, the vessels and the, the sternum. And this is what we defined as the uh, uh, thymic thoracic ratio. Another sign we published uh, a couple, couple of years ago by a really accidental observation is the light, dilated CSP after 22 weeks. And we found out that if you look at the normal variant, the normal values we measure in the middle because the shape may be changing of the CSP. You see that after uh, 50 millimeter, which is after 22 weeks of gestation, you have uh, almost 90% having dilated CSP. So the CSP dilation is not specific because you find it in Downs, you find it in trans 18. But if you see a conotrancal abnormality, you, you think this thymus is 
good looking and you look at the head, the head has a small uh, CSP square shaped normal. So it's probably unlikely. If however, you have vice versa, you scan the baby, you, have, you do the PPD and, you, and the patient came referred because of a, uh, uh, let's say of a cardiac anomaly. While you measure the BPD, you see, oh my God, it looks large. And then you look at the heart and you see the timer. So you have the diagnosis within a few seconds. So this is something inexisting in uh, postnatal studies because no one has, let's say, uh, it is not written in books of genetics. I mean. Now let's move to uh, to the, you see this, these are also images of the latent CSP in 2021. But sometimes I get the question, oh, if you've seen isolated CSP, is it going to be, of course not, because you have 5% according to the reference range who are going anyway to be slightly dilated. So it's not so specific, but in combination with other increases, the risk. Now let's move to uh, the next group of uh, skeletal anomalies. In general, the most two, two, two common one I want to discuss today, I cannot discuss all, it would be a special talk on, uh, on skeletal, uh, skeletal anomalies are uh, achondroplasia and uh, tonotophic dysplasia. They are the most common one. One is lethal, it is the tonotophic dysplasia and one is uh, common. It's called achondroplasia later detection. So in one paper of Linchiti some years ago, she showed the size of the femur in relationship to the gestation age. And you see that the early cases, for even from 15, 16 weeks, where the femur is very, very short, arthonotophic dysplasia, where in achondroplasia, the size of the femur is almost normal until 25 weeks. And this is in general a late detection at uh, after 25 weeks gestation. So uh, this is why it's not so uh, easy to use sometimes if you see the first time at 25 weeks, but it's it's okay. And the, the tanatophorics, they have small uh, ribs. So, and let's start now with achondroplasia. You see some examples, even, uh, as you see in the upper left, we were in Egypt in, a, in the Egyptian museum, uh, historic museum with Kipros uh, some years ago. And uh, I was lucky to uh, ask him to stay there to make a photo. And uh, you see, even in old Egypt, there were uh, a chondroplasia and you see Picasso and uh, uh, the young people know it from Game of Thrones today. So uh, uh, the most, it is the most frequent on little uh, skeletal dysplasia with one to 20,000. Uh, this is the frontal bossing, but honestly, I could sell you this nice video as a normal fetus. Uh, but uh, this, these hands are abnormal and the short bone, uh, long bones are short. So what is the trick I would uh, show you because it's detected in third trimester. There were two papers published on this field uh, by a French group and retaken by uh, Asma Khalil some years later. And look at now the shape of the femur. This is the femur and we have the femur with the diaphysis, metaphysis, and epiphysis. What we see here is the diaphysis. The metaphysis is the, the, uh, the second part of it. And then the part which is not yet ossified is the region of the, uh, uh, and the, the angle here to the between the metaphysis and the diaphysis. So if you draw, you see here the echogenicity, if you draw an angle here, the angle will be under normal conditions one, 100 to 115, so roughly. I'm not asking you to measure the angle, but look at now in fetuses with achondroplasia, you have here the, the, uh, the metaphysis is larger with the angle. So look at now here this video of a normal case and a normal case. Now, once you know it, I'm sure next time you are measuring a short long bone, you will have a look to it more carefully because you think, oh my God, is it going to be and achondroplasia, because you know, if you have short bones after 25 weeks gestation. In one of the uh, meetings of uh, Kipros, I, I was at breakfast with uh, Asma Khalil, and we were discussing her, her sign. And she said, Do you think that the values can be shorter even earlier? I said, Why not to us? And we checked with several people, we put data together, and we went to the database of some centers, and we found out that achondroplasia cases like here 31 weeks, 28 weeks, 31 weeks, and so on, have this typical abnormality of the, the diaphysis. But if we ask the, uh, the colleagues to send us the pictures they did at 20, week, 20 weeks when they were doing the routine scan and the diagnosis was not known, we found out that these were also present earlier in gestation. So theoretically, if you have some 
uh, either you see it or if you have some slightly short bones, you know, it is still in the range of normal, but head to femur is short and you start thinking of, uh, of down and the lady had her uh, NIPT and you tell her, no, we need an invasive because I don't know. Think of looking to the, uh, uh, the femoral diaphysis, metaphysis angle, if it's like this, think of uh, condition could be a chondroplasia. And this is a recent case I have followed since the beginning because uh, the, the, the father, as a, the husband of the lady had achondroplasia and they did the CVS, it was confirmed. So I had a chance to follow up. And you see here, it started to be out of the range at 25 weeks gestation. And this is what I was telling you. The head is large, the long bones are short, but the, uh, the ratio of head to uh, femur starts being uh, abnormal at 18, 19 weeks. So this is where you should seek for this uh, chondroplasia. Now we come to the second group, which is thanatophoric dysplasia. And uh, you, you see the word thanatos is the god of death in Greece. So this, these are obligatory uh, death going uh, uh, diseases. Uh, however, there is some, I saw in the meeting and uh, some studies saying that some can be treated, but this is only probably research. It is the second uh, most frequent one, one to 30,000. And it's detected in first semester, but generally second semester. You have two types, type one with the typical abnormal bones with a normal head looking, and type two with 10% uh, of the group. It is the cl uh, clover leaf skull with uh, rather long bones uh, straight. The typical, what you see here in uh, tantophoric dysplasia is the frontal bossing, of course, but typically you have very, very early short bones. You have short ribs, which is a sign of uh, lung hypoplasia. You have the typical short hands, which is not so quite different if you compare with the hands of uh, gestation of uh, achondroplasia, so not specific. This is why, how are we going to use new signs or other signs to know it is thanatophoric dysplasia? One of these is the, the size of the vertebra in comparison to the, to the intervertebral space, what is called platyspondyly. spondyli. And the second is the brain abnormality. So platyspondyly spondyly means, if you look at the spine carefully, and I hope if I have not seen this sign uh, next week when you are scanning, look at carefully the spine, you see that the vertebral body are quite ecogenic and large and the intervertebral space is uh, small. And uh, you see on the X-ray, it is this the normal X-ray and the abnormal one, and the intervertebral space is larger than the vertebral height. And this is here a normal case, and this is thanatophoric dysplasia with a linear probe where you see that it's really small in comparison to the space, best seen in the lumbar part of the fetus at 22 weeks. You see here, this is now, if you know the sign, you see, oh my God, of course, and this is why, do it simply when you have a fetus next time, and you think it's this, Go and have a look to uh, uh, to the spine and you'll see it. You may see also that the conus medullaris is very low, but this is uh, white, uh, let's say, seen in some other uh, diseases. And I think there are some other uh, skeletal anomalies with platinum spondyl can be seen, but not so frequently and obvious as in thanatophoric dysplasia. Now we come to the second sign, which is the brain sign. The brain here were published in two papers, not very well known. Uh, from uh, glass, glass in, in uh, Toronto and from the group here around the Phil glands in, in Toronto. And uh, it is known from pathology specimen that fetuses having uh, uh, thanatophoric dysplasia, they have an early maturation of the brain with a lot of gyration. And you see these gyrations are so obvious and uh, you can see them very well. But in the meantime, we know that this is not typical for temporal, sorry, for thanatophoric, but it's present in many FGF, FGFR mutation, the fibroblast growth factor uh, mutation and, re, and receptor, and this is why keep it in mind. So this is why you see at 22 weeks how it uh, how it looks like. So when I saw this, I said, "Oh my God, it's true." I said, it's "Well, but if it's..." already so severe at 22 weeks, it should start earlier. It should not start at 20 weeks, probably earlier. And next time I had a case at 15 weeks, I saw the typical short bones and so on. And uh, the uh, I saw for the platyspondyly, I could confirm it because you see this is the normal spine and this is the platyspondyly. You see here how thick. And then I had a look at the brain. I saw already at 15 weeks polymicrogyria. 
And then I said the same. If I see it at 15 weeks, it should start at 12 weeks, 13 weeks. And uh, uh, Anstoy, in his paper on uh, from Toronto, he, they put a case of 12 weeks. So, and then next time I had uh, 20, this is the 13 weeks fetus with short bones. I was watching here what's going on in the region of the brain. You see here the typical multiple gyration. And this is for me a simple sign. So you have, when you see some early disease of a bone, either you have osteogenesis imperfecta, but you don't have any bones here, only the occipital bones. So if you have less ossification, it's osteogenesis imperfecta, but you have tonotophoric dysplasia. Look at, look at this gyration and you have within few minutes diagnosis, but please scan vaginally because it's better to see it and abdominally to have a look with a linear probe of the platys spondyl. And this is here the brain put in a spoon by the pathologist. They were surprised that I could see at 30 weeks in the fetus of eight centimeters, the abnormal, abnormal gyration. Now let's move to uh, other brain anomalies and uh, ventricular as a hint. And I want to show you a, a case unusual Fetus referred because of ventricular megaly. And uh, you saw the, che the checklist we do is spina bifida, chromosomal anomalies, infection, agents, corpus callosum, hemorrhage, then the walker, so posterior fossa anomalies, aqueduct stenosis, this and carefully and so on. The list is well known, but you know, but life is not always like this. Life is sometimes different. So this is why you should be aware, as I told you, like uh, Sherlock, to think out of the box. So I had the case here, this patient came uh, to us, an Arabic patient, she wanted me to be scanned first by a lady, which is okay. So my colleague was scanning her and she said 10 millimeter, 11 millimeter. And she called me and told me, you know, I have difficult scanning conditions here. And uh, can you uh, have a look? So I said, okay, looks like ventricular megaly. And what do we have as additional uh, things? And uh, showed, I had a look to the images. We have a, a normal profile, nasal bone. We have uh, corpus callosum. Uh, we have posterior fossa with a normal size. And then I said, OK, let, let's go to the checklist. Have you seen the posterior fossa? She said, yes. The corpus callosum CSP, she said, OK. Sylvia Fisher was normal, as you see here. The face was normal. The heart looked normal, so it's not a combination. I said, is it a boy or a girl? And she said, it's a boy. I said, uh -huh. have, you, have you had a look to the thumb? It's a doctor that, yeah, I had difficulties on looking to the hands. And I said, what do you think? What is your uh, suggestion? She said, you know, there is something, one thing disturbing me is the, I don't have a, a quite nice view of the CSP because it looks like being in a shadow. And when she said shadow, I said, oh my God, shadow, 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 that stop, stop, stop. Shadow is a typical hint of craniosynostosis, and they could be also in macrocephaly. She told me, no, the size is normal. And these are the two papers showing the brain shadowing sign. You see here, there is a shadowing here, shadowing here. So I said, please, can I examine the lady? I asked her, you know, I cannot, I cannot guess here. I, have, I need to examine you. And I then I realized one thing. What is craniosynostosis? I told you that uh, the, the, the uh, temporal lobe dysplasia is typical for tanatophoric, but also in FGFR mutation. So I said, how are the bones? Because in the first moment I said tanatophoric, and then the bones are normal. And they said, okay, shadowing sign plus FGFR means there should be craniosynostosis with FGFR. What are the lists? Then you have in your brain few. You see, it looks like Crouzon syndrome or Appert syndrome and these two. So I said, okay, let's have a look to Appert syndrome sign. And I remember I had read the title in the prenatal diagnosis of Appert syndrome, temporal lobe abnormalities in free imaging. At that time I was smiling, I was smiling because I said, who cares in Appert syndrome to look at the brain because it's so obvious the face and the hand, the hands, but it's not true because at that stage the head sh shape was normal. So I took a look at the hand and it was the typical mitten hands. And because you know, another view may have seen or oh, think thought it could be the thumb and so on, but this is here Appert syndrome. Why? Because the combination of uh, craniosynostosis is not yet well developed, plus the FEG of our sign. Uh, reveal the disease later on at the follow-up 27 weeks then you had the typical signs with the uh, with the high head with an abnormal uh, face with the abnormal hands then you make the diagnosis but at that stage it was not so obvious the head shape so this is why i tried to tell you think out of the box now uh, we come to the next group and uh, we have here agents of corpus callosum as a disease 
this is where in general we give up because you say at least 70 syndromes. If you look at uh, corpus callosum in omim, you have 1,600 entries. So no way to know all these things. And this is why you should at least know some few. Uh, and among the genetic uh, array findings, you have the trisomy 8p, which may be common, but uh, this is what we see. When you have uh, Asian corpus callosum, this specific case, you have this plastic and you have abnormal vessel. What to tell the parents? I want you to know three diseases, three syndrome to know. One is a familiar one, another one is typically in girl and one in boys. So when I see, this is why when I see an abnormality of the brain, I ask boys, is it a boy or a girl? So for girls, there is one disease called Icardi syndrome. The problem in Icardi is that it has no gene yet detected and uh, it affects only girls. And uh, we don't know the genetic background. So in general, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. You should have done array and uh, exome and rule out anything else, but you still have the risk of having Icardi at the end. So, uh, and uh, so this is why if you have an Asian scopus callosum plus a female, Look at the eyes because the typical icardi was first described with abnormalities of the eyes, but in the meantime, we know there are microphthalmia, there are some coloboma, but typically it could be microphthalmia. And the, the typical typical uh, hint is the presence of cyst, choroid plexus cyst, or interhemispheric cyst. You know, the interhemispheric cyst in combination with the Asian scopus callosum plus a GERD, I would always suggest to think of Icardi syndrome and uh, the cortex because it can develop polymicrogyria, but extra uh, cerebral, maybe the spine can show, uh, let's say, uh, absent ribs or hemivertebra. So let's take a case. So a genesis of postcardosum, like this one here, you see it's a girl and you see that you have here uh, plexuses, you have a control and then you confirm. And uh, yeah, this is here one, uh, one case and uh, this case, uh, the cysts were less in follow-up, but you see in, in, in this region, there is an interhemispheric cyst as well, and these bumps. Uh, we don't have genes, so this is why you th should think of it. In this fetus here, there was an, a cyst in the brain, and it revealed to be interhemispheric cyst with Asian scopus callosum, but look at these bumps here. The bumps here is typical, and uh, this polymicrogyria in combination with the three other uh, uh, typical for Icardi syndrome. So uh, this is here on MR. You see the bum, this one I have not seen, but the other one was typically seen. So you see the combination, think of polymicrogyria of interhemispheric cyst in combination with uh, a genesis or genesis of corpus callosum. And here, uh, this is another case, the typical picture of both. So I did a dual photo, a genesis with a, a cyst and uh, looks like a girl and uh, the uh, multiplanar mode shows the other features as well. So you have at the end of the day, you will tell the parents, I don't know, I think it could be, but we cannot have, uh, let's say, the true combination, or let's say the confirmation. And I had a patient, which is, let's say, a nice, sad, sad story. Uh, she came and we had this diagnosis and she said, okay, no problem. And uh, she tried to fight on Facebook and she found the lady in London where the child was, the girl was three, three months old. And she, she asked her, you had a cyst and you have Asian scopus callosum, is the baby okay? She said, yes, okay. She said, my doctor told me here in Berlin that the risk of having uh, seizures and uh, epilepsy may be high because the disease can be occurred. I've never heard about it, no one told me my child is healthy. So, and she had a scan. Uh, and a week later, she came and she said, I want termination. I said, well, what happened now? So the lady she was asking on Facebook wrote her that you are right. Yesterday night, my daughter had epilepsy and we took her to the emergency room and we are now starting treatment. She's at the hospital and she said, oh my God, this is true. So you see that uh, these, these social media may be for sometimes in our work. So, and you see, this is a video. Look at now the, the absence of the corpus callosum the cyst and so on. There is a paper uh, submitted to the Wild Journal of 20 cases. I hope it will be accepted one of these days and you'll see the data of uh, different centers collecting 20 cases, but we have, I showed you now several cases. Now, uh, in other words, uh, Shellac will tell you if you see ACC, ask if it's a girl, and if it's a girl, check for the presence of any cyst in the, in the brain, check for the presence of uh, polymicrogyria because the combination can be typical and also for eyes 
anomalies. Of course, if you see eyes and brain, it could be also uh, like ciliopathy, but in general, when you have ruled out other things, you still keep in mind it can be more severe. Not only girls, but boys may be also affected. And uh, typically, what you know is hydrocephaly, but also agents is callosum. So many people do not know that ACC can be also the combination in the condition used to be called X-linked aqueduct stenosis, XLS. And uh, today we call it L1 CAM or L1 syndrome. So, uh, and I remember my earliest case was February 96. You see, I was very young at that time. And it was uh, the typical hydrocephaly with the uh, adducted thumb. And at that time, we were sending probes to the Netherlands, to the one trying to find the gene to know. We know the genes and this question of 10 days when you have the result. So uh, this is why if you see the combination, it, it is called sometimes excellent hydrocephaly, but also called crash for abbreviation of corpus callosum genesis retardation adducted thumbs. The adducted thumbs is found, is found in 75% of the cases. So next time you see the brain like this, you see it's a boy or a girl. If it's a boy, uh, go to the hands. If it's a girl, check for additional signs. And this is here, you see the, the thumb in these cases here. I'm hitting now that the baby changed the position of the hand but it stay in this case. And this is why I asked in the previous case, I showed you with the upper, uh, my colleague, have you checked the hands if it's a boy and ventricular megaly? Because this is the first thing I think, of. a simple sign, but very powerful. And this postnatal in one, uh, in the ch one of the children I've seen, and the ladies give me this uh, picture uh, of the child. Now this is why every time you have any brain anomaly with a male, check of the possibility of having L1 scam. It is more common than we assume to have one out of 15 to 20,000 cases, but also consider if you have a family history of a presence of a fra X fragile X syndrome. So uh, let's say, uh, my geneticists say it's rarely to have a spontaneous case like this. This is why the typical history, they tell you, I have a brother, he had some uh, birth damage, and because uh, the delivery was so long and his brain damage because of birth. And my uncle, the brother of my mother, is mentally handicapped. You see, you have two boys where the ladies can inherit uh, this condition. So think always on the possibility of having L1 camp. Now I come to, uh, it, it was supposed to be my last case, but uh, I will, uh, if, if you give me time, I'll show you another one. So uh, the edges of musculosum and what is called DCC, it is the third group. Uh, you may have occasionally parents having, uh, let's say, also an agenesis corpus callosum. Most of these do not know. No one will come to you and say, I have this disease. But they may have also one gene mutation. One of these groups is called DCC. DCC is, uh, is, an, uh, is a typical mutation where the uh, prognosis can be also uh, uh, good because the penetrance may be also incomplete. So the baby the father may not have or the mother may not have a lot of problem. It can be associated without internal disability, but they may have also typical signs. So this is why this is a, uh, an abstract by a French group. They uh, found that at the end, the presence of a DCC mutation improves the prognosis because you can tell the parents if this mutation, either one of you have it, but in general, the prognosis is, is, is not bad, is less good. And the shape, the DCC, is abbreviation of deleted and colorectal cancer mutation. So this mutation is also found in another disease of colorectal cancer, but it is also associated with the corpus callosum genesis. It is autosomal dominant, and it is involved in the guidance of access similar to the L1. So the penetrance can be either with no symptoms, or it can be only ACC, or it can be ACC with without congenital mirror movements or both. What is the congenital mirror movements? This is here, what, when you have a person, when this person uh, moves one hand, the other hand moves automatically without the chance of, uh, uh, let's say, that the, the person is able to, to, uh, to manage this. So it is uh, the intention movement of the opposite side. So, uh, and I had a patient, I asked her, uh, uh, this is the simple question, what you say, said, uh, do you have problems in uh, doing homework uh, at work at home? She said, I cannot cut any salad. And when I cannot work at home and things because my both hands are working the same, and I gave him a sheet of paper and said, please cut. Automatically, the second hand came together like this, like a scissor. And she's trying to cut. She's not able to touch, to, uh, to hold the paper. And look at now the fingers. They do the same movement as this one. 
This is why the simple sign is, I told her now, please try to hold the, the sheet of paper. She could not imagine she has three children, but could not hold it. The fetus had a brain anomalies, why it was easy to, to think uh, of. But you know, the, for them, it is normal. This is why they do not know how, how life is different. So, and this is the other way you have, what to tell the parents, move one hand and watch the other one. I said, move, please the right hand. And automatically the other hand start moving with the, the same. This is here, mirror movement. So it's really like Sherlock. You can give a task and you do something and you watch what is going on and you know within one second uh, what's going on. You see this fetus, you ask the mother and you do the, CV, uh, the amnio and they reveal the DCC and you go to the geneticist. And the lady told uh, the geneticist, can you tell now my husband that I cannot do homework, I cannot do cell and so it is, I have now medical indication to avoid all the homework. Uh, do I have time to finish with the actual case? I think yes. So this is the actual case uh, because I, uh, by chance, I found it. So I just was putting this this afternoon for you. And this is a petis I saw, you see here, uh, uh, August 21. She was referred because of polyhydramnio, macrosomia, macrocephaly uh, as a female. So uh, actually it was made diagnosed by polyhydramnio. You know, these cases, uh, uh, they call you, we have a polyhydramnio, in general, it is never polyhydramnio. It was four afternoon, I said, okay, yeah, she can come and have a look. And I was really surprised. I was really shocked because I measured the head was out of range. I measured the abdomen, it is out of range. The fluid I never saw uh, with an amniotic fluid index of 40. So, uh, and you, you see the, the shape between the thorax and the abdomen is large. It's a female because many of the, macrocephaly or macrosomia diseases like uh, simpson gulabi Demel are typical boy uh, diagnosis. So, and then I uh, I thought for a second, it could be uh, Beckwood Whitman, but the placenta is normal. The Beckwood Whitman, they have typical mesenchymal dysplasia of the placenta, and they have really large kidneys. So all organs are large. So this is why it was more a large liver. So I assumed for a moment, it could be some uh, uh, storage diseases, but why is the head large? And you see the shape of the head was also abnormal, large pericerebral space, but not so specific brain anomaly. Unfortunately, I do not have time to cover with you the possible differential diagnosis. And you see the nasal breathing to rule out uh, coronal atresia as the reason. I saw the esophagus and you see the amniotic fluid here, the, the third and the fourth quadrant were uh, with an AFI of 40. So, uh, and then I had a view to the face Theoretically, I could tell you, I see the downs landing uh, pulver fissure here, the low set of the ear. But you know, these things is when you are scanning, you say, you say it looks like a coarse face, which uh, is present in many uh, abnormalities. And then uh, I look at the heart, and for me, it appeared like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you thicken myocardium. And now you see large head, uh, large baby, no hydrops, polyhydramnio and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I thought on some of the rhizopathies, Noonan syndrome group, but Noonan, they are not, never large, they are rather small. But uh, we have had a case many years ago called Costello syndrome. Costello, they have typically large head. It had prenatal only a large head and postnatally two years later, it was diagnosed and the lady came for a second pregnancy. And uh, she told us that the large head was not because of the father, but because of Costello syndrome. And uh, I was watching the hand, and this is what I saw on the hand. It, is it overlapping fingers? Not so really. And uh, I did not like the hand for one second. And I remember at the last meeting, I was uh, somewhere, and I was sitting with Benoit, and we're sharing experience. This is the case from Bernard Benoit. He told me, look at this fetus. I saw this. The neck, the neck was thickened, 3.3 millimeters. The carry tab was normal. The, the, uh, the CGH was normal, but maybe we came too, too large, large head. Do you have seen fetus with large head? I said, yes, we had one. At the end, it was Costello syndrome. That it was Costello syndrome. And he said, how do you know? He said, the hand is typical like Costello. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at the hand here. And he told me, no, Costello, they have typical hand. It is even the, 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 the symbol of the society of Costello syndrome. What is typical is what is called the ulnar deviation. And this is what he could see. And then said, my God, it's true. And when I was scanning, I thought, 
thank you, Bernard. This is exactly what I'm seeing here. I see a could be Costello because of the ulnar deviation of the hand. And uh, I compare to a normal hand, you see the ulnar deviation plus the large head plus the polyhedramus. So I decided to write my report. I said, macrosomy can be typical for uh, conditions like metabolic disease, but also typical for Costello syndrome. And then geneticists, you know, but you Costello, they are small, they have uh, small statues that, you know, but check exome. So she had to be admitted to the hospital because she could not breathe. They had removed three liters of water and sent to our lab and uh, it turned to be, as expected, a Costello syndrome. And she came and said, you are great because you did the diagnosis. Said, you know, it's only watching, observing. And said, you know, the hand was so typical. Said, what the hand that, you know, the only deviation is not so common, but it could have been something different. I will not never show you if it was something different. So uh, this is why, uh, keep in mind, some complex anomalies may have simple syndromes. And the future probably will be, again, identify anomaly and ask artificial intelligence, put the data in the database, they will tell you the likely two, three diagnosis. You can perform anesthesia and you will ask the intelligence, artificial intelligence, and then you will say not one coffee, but you say one volume, please, because then you notice that you are losing your job because AI will may cover many of these things. So before I finish, I will uh, advi uh, advertise the next meeting, we are uh, doing uh, Katia Bilardo and uh, Timmerman and Testa in uh, Kiev online. And uh, famous people like uh, Ashok Kurana is speaking, like uh, Yaron Zalel. And we have a session on syndrome conditions second trimester. I will be speaking on uh, consanguinity. We have an afternoon only on first semester scan where uh, Dr. Lakshmi from India will speak on the cleft. So it will be a fantastic program. And to my knowledge, from Monday on, it will be a little bit more expensive, but now it is for the two days, some 80 euro, and you have 14 days access to this uh, to this meeting. So uh, register, and we'll see you there, all of you. And I thank you very much for your attention and for also for your patience, and also for the honor given to me to present this presentation. And I will wish you all the best and happy birthday, SFM India. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. And I, I think you are a, a mold of uh, Columbus, Holmes, and Sherlock. <laughs> I think you're put together uh, an amazing, amazing talk and amazing presentation. And it's an eye opener to all of us regarding simple approach to various uh, syndromic conditions. Thank you once again. Thank Dimal, you very please. much, sir. It was just mesmerizing, sir. And uh, I think uh, we didn't find normally any webinar right the, the moment the lecture starts we start getting the questions on the chat box there's not a single question which has come yet because i think nobody wanted to get their eye or concentration away from the talk they just wanted there <laughs> there are no questions you don't need questions no, no but no. you know uh, uh, i have to tell you uh, one thing some years ago i uh, after we finished the second edition of the uh, the third edition of the hard book i discussed with alfred uh, let us write a book on syndromes all things that we have seen. And uh, I said, okay, why not? And so on. And I started to put a table together and I had 180 syndromes, 180. So let's see, if you see skeletal anomalies will run the 20 common one and the heart anomalies also the common one. So, uh, and then he said, okay, if we spend one week each, we'll need three years. And after three years, there are news. So this is why we'll never finish. Don't do it. He said, okay, we stop doing it. <laughs> so this is why uh, and I had started one to do a talk on uh, syndromes from A to Z I arrived to B and stopped because it was already one hour uh, echodroplasia and Bart the Beadle and, uh, and uh, so so great thank you, thank thank you thank very you much, much. Thank, thank, you. thank you for all and thank you for your nice words I see here a lot of uh, uh, blessing for the society and yes uh, yes yes and some of, some of them confuse that it is your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but I you. am SFM. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Ravi. That thank you. Thank is you. marvelous. Oh, SFM started because of you. We're continuing because of you. And we're so okay. pleased you could do this yeah. special birthday event for us. We, uh, we, we, we were joined by yes. people from many, many countries tonight. And I'm so glad we made them all happy. 
There is one question asking, uh, is it prudent to attempt CVS in posterior placenta or should we wait for amnio? I think there is always a way in almost all so-called posterior placenta to get there because what you should do is uh, you should take the probe and push the uterus a little bit more to have the probe behind the uterus and push the uterus more anterior or let the patient lie for 20 minutes on the on her belly it rotates and then you can get it so but i will do the puncture let's say in the direction of uh, not from up to down direction of legs but uh, down to up so i go to the other side of the patient and you get it so this is a trick it's difficult to show so if you are comfortable in doing cvs you will do even it's so called posterior you can get it don't believe me Okay, everything looks simple, yeah? So great. What should I do now? Have there the coffee or uh, Valium? There was uh, another question on, on, on the size of the cavum septum pellucidum and its relationship to gestational age. Yeah, it is. So I showed you. So four millimeters, five millimeters. But there's a reference range. You can have the paper there. So it's... Uh, you know, I will not exaggerate. In general, the cases are so obvious. So please do not start saying, oh, it's 5.1 instead of 5.0. But, is it would you like to go subjectively regarding the size, shape, and uh, echogenicity of the cavum septum pellucidum, or more like uh, an object to parameters? It's, let's say I I I uh, I do not uh, use it as main sign as an additional sign. So this is why I will put it uh, as a combination. The presence of a coronotruncal anomaly in the combination of apparently small uh, timers and the slightly dilated CSP and so on. Because you should, you need always when you write some things to have, a, let's say, an escape door. So if you say, this is a large CSP, could be a brain anomaly and so on, and the result come normal chromosome. And then they says, what is about the brain? So what the brain, the CSP? Ah, oh, forget the BS. But you, you will write, oh, brain CSP, this is why. Uh, I, what I try to teach, and I hope you will take it with you, uh, there are true anomalies, there are hints. The true anomalies, you exaggerate. True anomalies, I exaggerate. The hints, I write somewhere. So the true obvious finding in that fetus was polyhydram is obvious, large baby is obvious, cardiomyopathy was obvious. But let's say the fingers, the hand, I did not write it because that is, oh, he will say it's crazy. <laughs> so this is why... Uh, there are two questions which have come in, sir, now. Uh, one was that, was there any tachycardia in the Costello case? Sir? Yes. Costello. In this case, no, but it's typical to have atrial tachycardia. But in this right. case, it was not. And another question is, if there is a trisomy 18 uh, with just rocker bottom foot and, uh, you know, the overlapping fingers, and there are no internal anomalies, do these babies do better? I don't know, but I think it depends mainly on uh, the growth retardation. If there is no growth retardation, it's really tricky to detect them. So I had a child, uh, let's say a patient who came to see me because of a, one child having not been diagnosed with trisomy 18. It was, had no anomalies, it was normal and until 30 weeks, and 30 weeks it was small, and it was delivered as trisomy 18, and they were having a nasal nutrition. But they will die then a few months or years, but they can go into one year or two years. We had one child who developed a liver tumor and they wanted to have a transplant. And people say, hey, come on, we cannot give one liver to a transplant 18 child. Yeah. There's one more. Face is, face is the window to many anomalies. Yes, it is the window for many anomalies. Yeah. Any correlation between ventriculomegaly and skeletal dysplasias? I showed you this one, but you know, almost, let's say many with uh, craniosynostosis, the group of craniosynostosis, they have often uh, ventriculomegaly. Uh, and uh, some of the skeletal dysplasia can be part of ciliopathies, Joubert syndrome, or and they may have ventriculomegaly. But let's say not, not typical for, uh, let's say, thanatophoric or for... Uh, let's say, uh, the astrophic displays, it's not the typical hint, but uh, the combination would increase the risk, of course, yeah. I think one of these days you need to do a lecture on uh, facial dysmorphism with uh, various conditions. I'm your man. Give me some months <laughs> time. <laughs> that, that is so kind I mean, of I promise you, I'm there for the 20th anniversary. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad we have a tenure extension to the contract. <laughs> yes. but, but this is, uh, yeah. One more question. I can put together. Yeah. I'm preparing a talk on the face, but needs a lot of time, so. Sir, one more question which has cropped up just now. Recently saw a case with bilateral clenched fist and no other anomalies. What will be the prognosis and what to counsel if the karyotype turns out to be normal? Well, only clenched fist is uh, unusual. In general, if you have really like this, you should have abnormal feet. And the chromosomes are in general normal. But you will check here is the uh, arthrogryposis uh, multiplex congenita. And what I do in these cases, I look at the lungs, get a sagittal view of the lungs to see if the lungs are getting small because they are often associated with the lung hypoplasia and polyhydramnios and so on. But like this, it, it is, could be very often a brain abnormality and not only, uh, not only doing by massage. So it's a bad sign. Well, it seems like we're coming to the end of a wonderful evening, Ravi. Thank you so much for making it uh, so successful. We have a few minutes from our, our trade partners before we shut tonight. And if I can have uh, the... Thank you, Ravi. That is such a delightful message you sent to all of us, uh, thanking us for the 10th year anniversary, but also that you will be so kind to do selfies with all of us. <laughs> We really look forward to an on-site meeting in the coming year. We promise you the first one we have, we would love to have you as a guest. I truly look forward to that. Today was an absolutely amazing talk. It's something I would love to have for breakfast every day. So I get inspired yeah. more and more. It is amazing how you have taught us over the years that everything can be simple. We don't have to have anything complicated. That is truly the essence of today's talk. We've come up with the biggest names and syndromes, but the easiest way of identifying them. Thank you so much for making this evening so fabulous. Thank you, Ashok. Thank, thank you all. And uh, thank, thank you, you Praveen. And thank you, Vimal. And uh, thank you. I love you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Bye. And with that, I also yeah, thank you. And I encourage you to, to uh, register for... Uh, for, for Ravi Chavez's meeting on the 3rd and 4th of December. We will put it out again on the WhatsApp groups tomorrow morning uh, so that you have an access to it. Uh, it's a virtual meeting and it's, it's very, very reasonably priced. They've been kind to us as always uh, with, with, with a discounted price. We also have um, and the, this opportunity to thank our, our back end, Mr. Vishal Mittal in the office, who's always there for all of us at all times and for Conferences International. Uh, for being there with us to put all these webinars together. My thanks also to LifeCell and to GE for the constant support they give us. And of course, to each one of you who's made this uh, great birthday party a huge success. And we look forward to celebrations throughout the year ahead. Thank yes. you so much. And thanks, Bimal. And thanks, Praveen, for Bye -bye. making a great evening. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.